Uh, I was listening with great interest to some of the interesting comments made today and thoughts about tourism and today's economy and society. But we you know we are in Jerusalem. We are in the city that has perhaps some of the greatest architecture in the world. And an architecture that continues to communicate across eternity the importance of space and culture and therefore tourism. So I would like to thematize uh, the importance of architectural space uh, in development truly of the city, not only as income, not only as an economic engine, but really how to bring a tradition and contemporary life and the future together. And I think that's something that, uh, that I've thought a lot about because my first project was in Berlin. You know, as a, as a son of Holocaust survivors, somebody who grew up under communist, in communist anti-Semitic Poland, you would not think that a topic such as Jewish Museum would be a great attractor of numbers in a city like Berlin. But that indeed is what happened, because what I tried to do is not just another building, another space, but link Berlin to the invisible sense of what the city is, to the fact that Berlin operates across a void created by the extermination of millions of Jews and many others as well. And that Berlin to be a city of the future has to create something that not only refers to the past, but as a hopeful future. And that is indeed really my experience of building a difficult project, the Jewish Museum Berlin. It was uh, started out as just a local project, later on became the project of federal government, and later surpassed all experts because it became one of the most popular buildings to be visited by millions and millions of tourists. And I think it's important that the building is not only visited by tourists, but let's think what is in it. There are no masterpieces in it. There are no great works of art in it. There are only the fragments of a destroyed history and the absence of works of culture, the absence of the Jewish people is part of the message that this building communicates. It's a dramatic building. Uh, it, I was the only architect not to connect the old uh, Baroque building with a bridge. There were 200 other architects in the competition who connected it. I, I thought, you know, the Baroque, you have to really go underground to the enlightenment, to the darkness of the enlightenment, to the beginnings of resentment against Jews in this open city and find out what is there, what is the story. And the story, of course, develops a lot of it is underground. There are roads. There is a road uh, to the dead end, the Holocaust, the road to uh, exile, the road to continuity. I even created spaces which have no, nothing in them, just, just, just a sharp light, uh, the Holocaust Tower, because I thought that's also communicating what Berlin is about, what do we want to see in that city, what have we seen in that city. So even spaces which don't have any obvious program can have a communicative and spiritual significance. Exile, of course, Berlin is exiled from itself, Germany is exiled from itself, Jews have been exiled out of Berlin, but what is this exile? It's also the symbolism of the creation of the State of Israel. This is a garden, seven times seven, 49 columns, the central column has the earth of Jerusalem, the rest, 1948, 48 uh, other columns with the earth of Berlin growing in these pillars. And again, a very disorienting garden. It's a garden that gives you a totally different sense of stability because do, we don't live in a stable world. We live in a world that has many, many instabilities and then this main stair that connects you to the hope of the future because why build a building if it has no hope? Doesn't end in an atrium, doesn't not end in a, in a big doorway, but it ends in a sort of a lateral shift towards the continuity of exhibits, which don't really even have windows. It's really a folded map of the invisible Berlin. A Berlin that we don't see, a Berlin uh, that we don't hear, a Berlin that, that is there still, and across the memory void. I call this the memory void because I actually tried to complete a piece of music written in Berlin by Arnold Schoenberg, who was a professor of music in Berlin, was exiled because he was a Jew, and he never completed his opera, Moses and Aaron. He wrote two acts, the third one, in which Moses asks God what it all means. He did not complete musically, and musicologists think it's not completed because there's no music, but I think it can be completed only in the echoes of the footsteps of the visitors across the void. So that's really the structure of the building. It refers to literature, refers to para-architectural ideas, to music, to poetry, to things that are not so obvious, and yet the public has embraced it in the millions. I built a secondary space, the, the sukkah, in the 
courtyard of the Altbau, the old building of the museum, and it is a very successful social space for dinners, for uh, events. In fact, last time I was there, there was a meeting of the German uh, military was meeting in the Jewish Museum. So yes, history goes on. We have to also put it, transform it, give it a direction that is positive and optimistic. And that is how I think a city changes. It doesn't just change because there's a lot of big projects. Sometimes a small building, a, a building that speaks about something important might have a bigger impact than huge developments. And that is the spiritual sense of Jerusalem, spiritual sense of Israel, spiritual sense of what we find in our country here. And at the same time, I was able to create across the street, new demand, the academy, uh, learning academy for the Jewish Museum. You can see it's in the old uh, Blumen market, you know, the, the flower market across the street. So I transformed it. I put these cake crates coming back with archives. And then this has an auditorium, uh, has a library. And I inscribed, you can't see it maybe so well uh, in this photograph, but I inscribed the, uh, the thought of Maimonides, a philosopher, one of my favorite philosophers, who said, hear the truth, whoever speaks it. And I put it in Arabic, and in Judeo-Arabic, in German, in English, and in Hebrew. And it's really the emblem of Berlin moving forward. And who, who would have known a city that, from which Jews were destroyed, from which humanity was exterminated, coming back, but from a very different sense of what it is to go through history, and where do we want it to go? How do we want it to be? Dublin, a very different place. You know, Ireland, uh, I love Irish literature. Almost every great writer outside of Shakespeare was, was Irish. Uh, from Jonathan Swift to James Joyce, from Oscar Wilde to Lawrence Stern. So I was able to build on the Docklands uh, an area abandoned in the city. You know, Docklands, there were old industrial uh, things on it. Uh, not a very attractive place. There was nothing happening. It's really a dark hole. And I was able to revive this through a public-private partnership. You know, it, it, it's, it's important, and it was said here, how to create a project that makes sense, to revive an area, to bring new engines of culture, economy, society. Now this area, this is a theater, Grand Canal Theater has about 2,200 seats. It has uh, created a piazza, and that is my idea to revive, and now there are office buildings, hotels, Google is moving in, Facebook is moving in, Microsoft is moving in, so it's a booming sense. Now, I always say it's not a great chokhmah, no great piece of wisdom to build an expensive building. You know, we know those expensive buildings, but how do you build a hall for two and a half thousand people almost for $50 million? And that's what I did, that was my ambition. Build something fantastic, dramatic architecture, now, I did it also because I was able to build office buildings, interesting, sustainable 21st century office buildings, really just around so to be able to finance this project. And internally, it is a, a really a spectacular hall for the first time, opera, musicals, performances, which have never been able to be played in Dublin, are here. That's a glass curtain, the drama of this glass curtain, which means that I pr produced a very small lobby, not the bourgeois lobby that, that we have from 19th century, but a very shallow lobby, really using the piazza as the lobby and making a very efficient and compact building. It's a very popular place. It has shifted the entire center of culture and sort of happening. There are thousands of people near the building, in the building, around the building, and this place, which used to call, be called uh, in Dublin Misery Hill, that's the original name, has really changed the character. Now, Las Vegas, we've heard about Las Vegas, and I was lucky to work in Las Vegas uh, on one of the biggest projects in the United States for MGM Mirage, a competitor to the Sands, uh, to create a really kind of a new city center, but a city center that doesn't turn away from the Strip, but is a 21st century building. And you can see in the front, is the crystals, of course there are hotels and other things in the project. And here it is, the crystals on the street, there are big hotels and so on. But what I wanted to do is a building that really blurs the line or that erases the line between culture and commerce. Because we have this line very strongly in our minds. Here is culture on one side, here is commerce. But no, I think architecture can change that relationship. And I created, really this is a, a shopping center, but my interest was to create a shopping center which, first of all, is not like any other shopping center. First, first of all, it has daylight. It's sustainable. It was voted as the most sustainable building in Nevada. It has windows. You can see out. It does not have illusionistic skies. It doesn't fool the visitors. It creates just a new visceral space, both on the Strip and as a gateway to really new programs. 
you can see that internally it is also very different. There are really high end shops and so on, but it's a dramatic. There's a train that actually has a train stop there on top. You can see it. And what I wanted really to do is create a space, cultural space, believe it or not, in Las Vegas and the Nevada Opera, the Nevada Ballet has performances in this building, which just shows that the old idea that you build a museum here and a shopping center there is an idea of the past. The idea of the future is really to bring together almost incom incomprehensible sort of opposites into a singular memorable space. And I think memory is a key in developing a space that brings people back and forth and, and, and isn't just a one-time visit or is not just a visit to, to a single activity, but a visit that is a cultural resonance. And to me, that's what cities are about. That's what Jerusalem is about. It's about the deep cultural resonance that the city has after you have left it and when you come back to it. I think that's the connection of architecture, city, memory, tradition, and also 21st century. So there it is, uh, a, a, another really great attractor, great generator, of the economy of this very competitive city in terms of shopping and other things, but also a incredibly new idea. Just now, uh, James Turrell, the great uh, uh, artist of light, has taken one of these apexes, these strange spaces that I created, to create a museum of light. You know, it's, it's a museum of light, and six people will be admitted at a high price at, at, at any single time, and it'll be, again, an experience that brings art, very avant-garde art, into the middle of a commercial experience. So there it is, something that even Las Vegas, with all its hotels and all its activities, has created a non-illusionistic 21st century building on the Strip that shows that there is a changed sense of reality. It's not the same as 20th century, and society moves forward, the cities move forward, and the cities have to reinvent themselves. Nobody can just depend on the divine grace of being blessed. You have to do something to create that momentum. And I did that also in Dresden. It's a very uh, f famous city. You know it from these paintings. Uh, it was considered uh, you know, the, the, the Venice of the North. But you also remember this, the city that was destroyed, completely leveled in the Allied bombings. And I, how do you create an attraction when the program is to design a military history museum of Germany? But that's exactly what I thought was important. Take the old armory, which was a German museum, the largest in Germany, by the way. It was a military museum, the Saxon military museum, the German military museum, the Nazi military museum, the Soviet military museum, East German military museum, and now in a democracy. They didn't know what to do with it, so I won a competition. My idea was uh, very simple. Restore the, the, the armory, the 19th century armory, but also create a cut, create something really dramatically modern, because Dresden is all about Baroque, you know, rebuilding the Baroque, restoring the Baroque. I said, enough is enough. You know, this is about history of Dresden. Let's create something that is really powerful. And you can see this vector. This vector traverses from the opacity of the armory right to the front, penetrating through, creating completely new space, and juts out, as I think it should jut out, because in a democracy, the military should not be hidden behind walls. It should be visible to the public. And you can see the angle. It juts out just off the center, very specific angle. The angle points, the, the side of the, that triangle points to the great view of Dresden, the rebuilt city with Frauenkirche, all those Baroque buildings. But the point and the form is self-similar and points to the triangle from which Dresden was bombed in the Allied bombings. I think it's important for everybody who sees the view of this city to see also this disconnection that the city was destroyed. For, for good reasons, because it was center of armaments, center of destruction of Europe, of other cities, a city that every citizen should also know that, the, that there was a destruction and why the city was destroyed and the exact geometry of the destruction. Now you can see that in this model, it's a cut, uh, as you, the, the horizontal plane is German military history from the 13th century to today, Afghanistan and so on, Iraq, there are German troops. And the arrow, this, this vector, disrupts it exactly between 1914 and 1945, those, those horrendous years of militarism. And in this new space, it's not a museum of weapons, it's, it's a museum that poses questions. Why do people follow fanatical leaders? Why do people engage in organized violence? Why do people do what they do? Let them think, let people think about it. So it's a very special 
new, and I'm very proud of it, was just voted the best museum in, uh, by Association of Museums, uh, best museum uh, in, in the world as, as voted today. So thank you, uh, thank you. Because it deals with a difficult topic. It deals with a difficult topic, you know. But the difficult topics are the topics I, that I'm interested in. Because you, if you hide them, you don't really do anything sort of interesting. And here, in this cut, you can see this, this juxtaposition. And you can see the power of this form. You can see the military history going back in the arsenal, back way you know, to, to thousands, hundreds of years. You can see the drama. Where, where you are really distorted in space. You're no longer relying on the obvious strategic uh, orientations. You see weapons really emblematically in a very precarious and dangerous way where you really get the sense how incredible it is, how violent humanity has become. And you see what falls on top of you. You see, you see that the consequences of destruction, the, the nemesis, what happens to people. And then as you ascend this last exhibition on top, you see the destroyed cities of Europe. You know, Vialichka, Coventry, uh, Rotterdam. You see all the destructions that took place from, from Dresden. And then you ascend and you're out of the museum in this tip, precariously hanging, looking at this incredibly impressive Baroque city coming back to life, but also creating something that is modern, and I think that's important. That, that, that architecture isn't just frozen in a certain time as if time has stopped, because time doesn't stop. Times go on, and, and there is that impetus to connect time to the visceral, to the, to, the, to, the, to the arteries that run not only in our hearts, but in our brains. Singapore, you know, we talked, uh, I heard a lot about Singapore, and how strange that I would show you a project which is a residential project. You know, what does a residential project have to do with tourism? You know, you can understand that a million visitors came in one year in Dresden, a city that really venerates churches, Baroque music, and so on. So coming to a military museum is, is not so easy for, for Germans or others. But now many Czechs, Poles, uh, Brits, other people come to the museum. Now, in Singapore, I had the chance to design a whole neighborhood on Keppel Bay, again, a, an abandoned place. And I want to say that Singaporeans are interested in public space. So I worked closely with authorities who permitted me and our developers to create these doubly curved towers. High density, one of the highest densities in the world, two and a half thousand apartments, all along the waterfront, but giving everybody a unique view, a unique sense of urbanism, of, of great cafes, of places to be, places to walk, amenities, clubhouses. This has become a gateway. You know, of course, uh, we normally think we judge cities by their museums, their cultural facilities, their churches, their synagogues, their sacred places. But increasingly, people are realizing that in democratic world, we're going to judge the cities. How well do people live in those cities? Do they live well? Do they have good apartments? So that's really this impetus for this, for this project. Create something that is prosaic, everyday life. Uh, and yet, I think something that is inspiring, something that has preserved nature, because if you build high density, you can, you know, it's a small country. And so you can't just spread the development to make it sustainable. And I'm proud to say it became the most profitable project ever in a city which is very competitive and very, very uh, sort of active in terms of creating things. So again, bringing back a, a residential sense of a gateway, tourism, you know, tourists don't normally don't go to, to see residential quarters, but they do come to New York to see office buildings, to see you know, Park Avenue. I think that's part of also developing a great city. Uh, in Denver, uh, I, I won't go on because I have too many, too many projects, but again, a city that was a bunch of parking lots, uh, I created a very dramatic building uh, that, that could hold large exhibitions like New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, a building that is connected to an existing building. But again, the drama of space, of light, of a genius loci connected to the mountains, connected to the valleys, connected to the vertigo that you even get in those places, and a social space for people to, to and, and of course exhibitions, 21st century exhibition, projections, it's not only Western art, and creating a sense of publicness, a piazza, housing, dramatic perspectives, reviving an area in the middle of the city that was really abandoned. And now it has become the art district, the new museum has been, two new museums have been built, galleries have opened up. So culture drives cities uh, as much as any economic calculation. And I end here in a project that uh, to me is, is perhaps one of the most important projects. I call it Memory Foundation, Ground Zero. Because if you think about, if I think about it myself, this project, 
often, I'm often asked, where were you on September 11, 2001? And people are sometimes kind of surprised when I say, you know, I was in Berlin because after 12 years of constructing the Jewish Museum in Berlin, the Jewish Museum opened its door at 10 o'clock to the public on September 11, 2001. And I came to my studio and I turned to Nina, my wife and partner and my colleagues and I said, this is the first day I don't have to think about Jewish history in Berlin because people will enter the building and they will see that history for themselves. And by about 2.48, 10 to 3 p.m., the, music, the Jewish Museum closed its doors for three days. There was such uncertainty what these attacks meant. So when I uh, competed uh, to design Ground Zero, really I thought not just about a single building, not just a memorial, but how to bring a memory to a city and how to move that city forward. I, I created many ideas that had to do with liberty, with, with organizing the buildings into a very, very special neighborhood. And that's my original sketches. Uh, you can see that the difference between my design and most of my competitors, great architects, you know, Richard Meyer, Peter Eisenman, uh, uh, Foster, Rogers, I mean the luminaries of architecture, everybody had one idea, build things just in the middle of the site. And I said, no, where people perish, you should not build anything. It's a piece of real estate, but we should not use it. So I did not use half of the site. I thought that's not really usable. Build a building on the periphery, create a public space a memorial, something significant, and then create a dramatic set of buildings, not mega structure. Everybody proposed one tower or two big towers or, you know, mega, mega building. I said, no, spread the density to as many buildings as you can so that the buildings are lower, safer, and create much better streets because you don't get the wind tunnels, you, don't, you get sun on the memorial. Okay, so that it is. The Freedom Tower, 1776, important. The spire just went up, I think last week and has restored the skyline to not just the biggest building, tallest building in the Western Hemisphere, but a building that has an unsurpassable number. 1776, after all, is the date of the Declaration of Independence. It's really the first document of human rights uh, in the world. So that's the, my sketch on the left. That's the latest rendering. You can see that for such a project, you need to garner consensus. There are so many stakeholders. I don't show this out of vanity, but I show you how complicated this process is. We've got the families of the victims. We've got the Port Authority who owns the land and leases the land to, uh, to developers, private developers and architects. You have the uh, governor of New York and New Jersey who control the Port Authority. You have the mayor of New York who controls the streets of New York, path authorities, the trains, underground and, of course, subway trains, MTA. So it's, it's, you have to garner in a democracy. You have to bring people together around really an idea. And my idea was create a, really a new neighborhood, not just one building, a new neighborhood that is really not really part of just Wall Street, but towards the Hudson River, open the space, create cultural facilities, a museum, create something symbolic, something that is impressive, something that will inspire people, not just with a tragedy that befell New York and the world, but also something that reaffirms freedom, liberty, and what America is all about. So that is the project, that is the site plan. You can see that uh, it's really facing sort of the spiral of buildings that, that emulates the sort of the torch of liberty just to the south is open towards the Hudson River. There are many, many public spaces. The slurry wall, which was that grand thing we should have never seen, this huge foundation. You know, when I went down to, to this site, uh, and I was with all the architects, I have to tell you this little story. With all the famous architects in the world in one Liberty Plaza, right across the street, on a miserable November day, and somebody from the Port Authority said, is, does anybody want to go down to the site, and everybody said, no, it's much better visible from a high-rise building, you can see it like a, from an airplane. But I went down with Nina, and we, in this windy, terrible, rainy day, very sad day, down 75 feet to the bedrock, and that's when I realized my life has changed. This is where I experienced what it means to come close to what people perish. Thousands of people perished at this bedrock of New York, and I thought this wall, which is actually a huge dam, because on the left side is Hudson River, the waters of the Hudson River. This is an incredible foundation that, that sort of protects New York from being flooded by the ocean. I thought, yes, this should be visible to the public. It's not so easy to, to, to you know, usually uh, foundations are made to be built on top of it. It's hard to expose a foundation. You know, dead foundations can be seen. In Athens, in Rome, you can see dead foundations. But in a living city, it's hard to expose a foundation. And yet, 
I had the collaboration of engineers from the Port Authority who liked the idea that we should see the foundations from the bedrock, and that's the foundations that even support uh, the Freedom Tower and other buildings. So this will become a museum, the, the September 11th museum, which I think will open next year, a very moving, an experience that I think no one has ever had because no one has been so deep down. You know, many, many floors down below the street. You will access it from the visitor center. And maybe only workers, uh, construction workers, have ever been this deep in New York other than those who perished. The, the beautiful uh, memorial designed by Michael Rod, uh, according to my plans with the waterfalls, uh, as, as a, a really a, a magnificent, I think, space. And I, I suggested from the very beginning to have waterfalls. Uh, it was strongly criticized by the tabloid papers. We don't need Niagara Falls in the middle of New York. But I thought we do need water because water is a formation of life. It also is an acoustical barrier against the very busy streets of New York. And I added another site, another public space, which was not required at all in the competition, the Wedge of Light, a, a space between tower number two and the center of the path terminal, uh, which is determined by light, 8.46 a.m., when the first tower was struck, and 1028, when the second tower collapsed, and the building standing in this spiral of configuration, rising to 1776, and creating really a neighborhood uh, that will shine not only from the distance, from the metropolitan area, from New Jersey, Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, but will really speak to the streets of New York, where really most New Yorkers are and most people are. And you can see it here. It's, it's uh, Freedom Tower is now, this is before, but the spire is there. It, it, it's really there. The tower number four, you can see, is there. And I have to tell you, uh, I, I wanted to create a project. You know, my parents were works, workers in sweatshops of New York. They had hard lives. But I thought, you know, what is it for New Yorkers? It's not only the, the you know, the, the beautiful buildings, of office buildings. It's what is, what is it about America? What is it about New York? And because I was also, you know, I have two promised lands, Israel and New York, uh, I thought, yes, it's a, I was an immigrant also to New York, and I thought, what the Statue of Liberty affirms. You know, Emma Lazarus, the Jewish poet, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled passes yearning to be free. That's what's written on the Statue of Liberty. And she's holding the Declaration of Independence and the, and the torch of light. I thought, that's what New York is about. That's what freedom is about. This is affirmation of life in face of terror. Thank you. Mr. Daniel Leibskins, thank you very much for an incredible insight into the design of the world in which we live I, that has changed my view of buildings and I, I think we'll probably all leave this building with a, a different set of eyes.